Hi, Muggles. So you want to make a real magic wand? Then watch this! Greetings, Muggles. My name is Professor Petros, and I'm a member of staff of a certain school of witchcraft and wizardry. And I know you're here to find out how a magic wand, a real magic wand, is made. Now, as you would imagine, we would not normally be sharing this information with anyone outside the wizarding world. But again, as some of you may know, in the will of the late and much lamented headmaster of this school, provision was made to fund the sharing of a small amount of knowledge between the magic and the non-magic worlds. This is officially called his Muggle Concordance Initiative, and the idea is that by gradually revealing of the magical to the non-magical world, the people of the One might become used to and come to accept the people of the Other, and eventually it would no longer be necessary to go to that enormous expenditure of time and effort which it now takes to conceal the presence of the One from the Other and indeed to convince the non-magic world that witches, uh, wizards, spells, magical creatures, and all the rest are merely the stuff of fairy tales. Well, uh, the Ministry of Magic has authorized a number of initiatives of which this is one, and these instructions are made available now with the full permission of the Ministry of Magic, uh, who have laid down only one stipulation, and that is uh, that no actual magic be used in the making of the wand, in case it should accidentally be seen by muggles. We are also thankful for the assistance and cooperation of Professor Durkin, our Muggle Studies teacher, and of one of his pupils, Tom. You've already met Tom, I know. Tom is in his new year here, and we're very fortunate to have his assistance. He is uniquely qualified to help us in this project, as Professor Durkin will explain later on. You see, uh, Tom's taking part in this project is actually of use to him, as well as to you, in that it forms a section of his assessment in Muggle Studies. To that end, he has been given free rein to use whatever equipment and stores the school may have to help him, but he must work entirely alone. However, Thanks to the use of a simple variation of a revealing charm, we will be able to see images of Tom at different stages, even though no one will actually be with him, and in this way we will be able to ensure his safety at all times. Tom is a bright pupil, and he has exceeded our expectations in every subject so far though there are two in which he particularly excels, and one of them is Muggle Studies. Otherwise, we would not be giving him such freedom in this complex and potentially dangerous area of study. But now, enough of these introductory remarks. We must turn to the serious business 
of wand making. Wands, with few exceptions these days, are still made from wood, but although the wood can be of one of a number of different kinds of tree, each with its own peculiar advantage, wand makers quickly came to understand that it is not so much the kind of tree which matters, but the fact that certain individual trees possess powerful magic of their own. Now, their timber is ideally suited to the making of wands. Such trees are called wand trees, and the first thing Tom will have to do is to find a wand tree. Tom's first steps on this tricky path began in the most obvious of all places to find timber, a forest. Uh, not just any forest, but one specifically suggested to him by his examiners. Now, one trees are not commonplace, and the forest which Tom must search was a large one. However, he did have the following advantages. Firstly, he knew, he had been told, that there was such a tree, just one tree, in the forest. Secondly, he had been given a professional wand-maker's wand, a wand specifically chosen and used for many years to find the signs of a wand-tree. And thirdly, and this is always important in any task of whatever kind. Tom had a determination, and he continued to search the forest for the entire day, even though the results were disappointing. At last, at the end of the day, as the sun was starting to set, he came to the edge of the forest and saw signs ahead of a clearing. A clearing which promised perhaps better luck. And pushing through the branches of the last remaining pine trees into that clearing, he saw for the first time definite signs that this was a place which knew magic. An examination of the ground uh, revealed the hoped-for signs of botricles, uh, which always inhabit wand trees, and amongst the leaves the unmistakable shells of moke eggs, making it certain that the wand tree was within, say, a hundred yards in any direction. Uh, but where? Well, Tom knew that he was looking for a tree of considerable size in height and girth, because it would be an old tree. And because of its magical properties, it would also be a tree of distinct and remarkable character. From his previous studies, Tom also knew, as all wand-makers before him have known, that wand trees often look much like any other tree in broad daylight, but show themselves most obviously in that short period of twilight, that magical time between the full light of day and the inky blackness of the night. So he was patient, and he looked about him as the light failed, and Sure enough, as the sun began to dip below the horizon, there was the wand tree, preeminent amongst all the others. And now the aspiring wand maker must move quickly before the light goes completely. Tom was carrying, as I'm sure you've noticed, a red bag containing 
wood lice, an offering for the bow truckles which always inhabit wand trees, and unless distracted, these otherwise harmless creatures can be a considerable nuisance and, and even cause injury to the wand maker as he tries to remove wood from the tree in which they live. Uh, before taking wood from such a tree, a professional wand maker approaches it at dusk and holds aloft a handful of wood lice, of dead wood lice, I uh, hasten to add, uh, and thereafter scatters them in the leaves and grasses around the trunk of the tree. Now, throughout most of the night, the bow truckles, who have seen this happen, will come down and spend hours scavenging for the wood lice, so that the day after, when the wand maker arrives, he'll find no sign of the bow truckles. They'll all be too full and too tired to cause any bother. When Tom arrived at dawn the following day, he was able to examine the tree, and he was not disappointed. The spiral growth of the trunk, with its heavy ribs and crevices, spoke of the bitter winters and storms of the past. He could almost hear it whispering its secrets to him. And at a touch of the wand-maker's wand, Tom felt a distinct tingle run through his fingers and down into the earth like sunbeams striking the forest floor in summer. As he looked up, the great trunk seemed to gaze out all around, and was covered with distinctive burrs and nodules. Higher still, a tangle of massive limbs spread out in all directions, and there was no doubt that this was the tree, the wand tree, for which he had been searching. Then, as Tom stood with one hand resting on the tree, an extraordinary thing happened. For just a few seconds, the wand tree, with those around it, revealed itself in full leaf as it had been during the previous summer. Now, this is a sign of acceptance, and experienced wand-makers know that this is a rare sign, and one of mutual understanding between the wizard and tree. And now, there is one thing which you must never do, and that is to actually cut wood from a wand tree. A wand made from timber taken in this way will never do any good for its owner, and may in fact be positively cursed. For this reason, cutting wood from a wand tree has been made illegal for many years. Fortunately, such trees shed dead timber regularly, and there is always a supply of such discarded branches on the forest floor. Tom soon found a mass of it on the leeward side of the tree, and he set about examining it at once. He knew too well than to attempt to make a wand from a stem such as this one, which would only be of use to a jester or someone contemplating very dark magic indeed. And before long he had selected a suitably true running branch from which to cut a section, uh, using, as per ministry instructions, an ordinary muggle saw. Having successfully completed the first part of his task, uh, Tom was now ready to make the wand itself, and for this next part I will hand you over to Professor Durkin, who, as Tom's muggle studies teacher, 
mm, is best placed to describe what Tom did next. Yes, thank you, Professor. And I must start by explaining that Tom's interest in Muggle studies has resulted in his being quite unusually capable of impersonating an ordinary Muggle, as you can see here. Remarkably accurate, even down to his strange shoes. And earlier this year he took a holiday job with a number of others in an ordinary Muggle workshop not far from his home, where his employer and fellow workers readily accepted him as nothing out of the ordinary. Indeed, Tom's employer still believes that he got the idea of making a wand as a sort of practice piece from having seen one of his colleagues using a lathe. For our purposes this was extremely valuable, as it made it possible to introduce the wood from the wand tree into this workshop, where it could be worked on using only the ordinary muggle tools. A surprising number of these is needed in a project such as this, a tools for piercing, measuring diameters, marking, shaving down turning, that is to say, shaping the timber on the lathe, planing, measuring length, etc., all needed when a wand is to be made without the use of magic. But first I must make it quite clear that the tools in a muggle workshop, whilst very ingenious and capable of remarkable results considering their crude nature, can be dangerous, and you should only attempt to follow this account if you are fully competent and familiar with the tools shown, or at the very least if you are supervised by someone who is. It must be remembered that sharp tools produce the best results, and are also the safest, but sharp tools also cut people just as easily as they do wood. This account should be seen as a description rather than a set of instructions to be followed. You must be aware of safety issues such as loose clothing, long hair, the need to remove rings, etc., and many other points which we have no time to describe here. Now. I have Tom's notes to hand, made in cooperation with his employer, and will therefore be able to describe the whole process accurately from a muggle point of view. The principal tool to be used here is a device used for spinning a length of wood, and is called a lathe, which contains in its main section, seen here on the left, an electrical motor. With the end cover plate removed, it can be seen that the motor, which spins the lower black pulley, drives the upper black pulley by means of a rubber belt. Using two pulleys in this way makes it possible to vary the speed at which the wood spins. The upper pulley is fixed to a steel rod or shaft on this side of the motor housing, and to a round metal disc on the other, as you see. In this way, the motor spins the disc, and it is to this disc that the timber to be worked on is fixed. The timber in different lathes is secured in different ways. In this case, Tom's employer uses a simple spike to locate the wood at the centre of a disc of abrasive paper, and to give it grip. This suits the simple turning work he needs to do, but other lathes will have their own way of holding the timber. The electrical motor drives this end, called the head, whilst at the other end, we may call it the tail, the wood is simply held onto a point which has bearings allowing it to spin freely. The tail is fitted with an adjusting wheel, screw thread and nut, so that the wood can be held firmly between it and the spinning head. The wood you are likely to start off with will have been trimmed straight and flat on all sides and ends, and Tom's employer has done this for him, using a highly dangerous tool called an electrical saw. Some of the wood will be wasted in length as well as thickness, and you will need an extra two inches or so in addition to the finished length of your wand. So, for a wand of overall length, say, twelve inches, you have to start with about fourteen inches of timber. You need to find the centre of the timber at each end, by drawing lines across the corners, with the timber held upright in a vice. The crossing points of these lines are marked with a bradle, as seen here, and these centre points are used later to position the timber on the lathe. But first, it is usual at this stage to largely remove the sharp corners of the wood with a plane. Great care must be taken when mounting the timber in the vice, as it is likely to slip, until the first two opposite corners have been planed off. You can see that Tom has drawn a circle, using a pair of compasses as a guide to planing, but an experienced craftsman would not need to do this. Another traditional tool for this job is the muggle spoke shave, originally used to trim the spokes of the wooden wheels at one time used in carts and carriages. This tool has a blade mounted between two handles, and is lighter and quicker than the plane. 
The wood is next positioned onto the head, that is the driven end, of the lathe, centering it on the bradle point, before securing it firmly at the free end by means of the adjusting wheel and nut. In this way, there is no possibility of it being loose and flying off when the motor is spinning. A solid metal tool rest is adjusted to be close to the work, and just a little higher than its centre line. Always turn the wood by hand before activating the motor to be certain that no part of it is actually touching the tool rest. A tool called a round gouge is used for much of the next stage. It is a kind of chisel with a rounded body and end. The motor is switched on, spinning the wood, and the gouge is then used to complete the removal of the corners, working with great care to gradually remove shavings of timber from one end to the other, turning the gouge slightly to face in the direction of its movement as it slides along the tool rest from left to right and back again, finally resulting in a wooden cylinder with a diameter at this stage of around one inch. Notice the waste wood at each end which cannot be worked on with the gouge because it is too close either to the head end, taking the gouge too close here could be dangerous, or to the tail end, reducing the wood here would cause it to split. At this stage the limits of the handle, that is everything other than the one's plain shaft, are marked on the wood with a chinograph or other pencil. The motor is started again, and the pencil held against the wood from behind of course to make the marks more obvious as you can see in this image of the timber when it has stopped rotating. The gouge is now used to cut away the wood where the grip will be in the middle of the one's handle. Be sure that the corners of the gouge are not allowed to touch the wood, otherwise they will dig in and leave marks. Next, the gouge is used to shape the one's shaft. Again, there is a choice possible between a simple cylinder or a long taper, such as we see here, or other designs in which bulges or swellings figure. The purpose of these is to better fit certain ones, either for their individual owners or the uses to which they will be put. You can also see that Tom has started to form the rings and other embellishments on either side of the handle. Again, this is a matter for experience, but more for instinct. The use of tools such as finer gouges, or the skew chisel, or the parting tool, are all needed at this stage. Finally, with the wand spinning in the lathe, all surfaces are smoothed by the use of increasingly finer abrasive papers, starting with the one known as, um, yes, P120. By the way, I should say that uh, Tom's employer had to warn him to keep his sleeves out of the way of the spinning timber, something which is easy to overlook, though the use of the thumb to steady the work is permissible at this stage if done with care. Notice also that abrasive paper of only the finest kind applied very lightly should be used on the turned rings, etc., otherwise their shape will be spoiled. The large black tube, you can see, is the end of a vacuum cleaner hose used to remove the dust created. When the smoothing is finished, the lathe is stopped and the wand is cut from the waste pieces at each end with a fine saw. The rough timber at the tip of the shaft is shaped by holding it against the spinning abrasive disc on the lathe, or it can be done by hand. Now we see the final result, which Tom felt the need to try out for balance, something which his fellow workers thought rather amusing, though if they'd looked more closely they might have seen signs of that other subject in which Tom particularly excels, a defence against the dark arts. And now we move to the finishing stages. Here you see Tom brushing on a stain, made from traditional materials by his employer, um, let me see, um, a little French polish, uh, spirit brown, spirit red, methylated spirits, and so on, which is allowed to dry overnight. As you can see, this has considerably darkened the wand, but left it rather dull. It will also have raised the grain of the timber, as the muggles say, in other words, made the wood feel rather rough. Because of this, it is necessary to smooth the timber again using the finest of abrasive papers or wire wool, always working along the length of the wand, hardly touching the rings or other ornaments, and being sure not to rub off the stain. When this is done, you may, as Tom did here, add further details by picking out parts of the design in a different colour. Tom used a very fine brush and a black stain mixed with French polish, which dries hard on the surface. The last stage is to apply a finishing coat of polish. There are many kinds of varnishes, lacquers, and other polishes, each applied in their own way. 
Tom was provided with a traditional French polish, his employer favours traditional methods, which he brushed on, turning the wand as he worked and being careful not to allow any drips. Notice that this must be done first with the handle, which is then allowed to dry by standing in the wand in a cup, at least overnight, and then, when the handle can be held, the shaft is polished in the same way. At least two coats of this rather thin polish must be used. Other polishes will need a different method. Finally, when the polish has set for a further two weeks and become really hard, the finest steel wool, a grade uh, 0000, it says here, is teased out and used to apply a finishing wax. When this is set for a few hours, the wand is polished by hand with a soft cloth. And here, after many hours' work, is the final result. The handle looks most realistic, with its details of shape and colour, and the shaft looks exactly like one suitable for duelling or defence. Shorter shafts allow a wand to be concealed and drawn more quickly, and are favoured by aurors. Altogether a very commendable project. Thank you, Professor, for that very detailed, one might almost say, exhaustive account. It is a pity that we could not show the use of magic in the manufacture of wands. It is a fascinating subject. But the Ministry was quite insistent that this was one step too far. And in any case, at least it has been possible to show how to make a wand by purely muggle means. And although your wands won't really work as such without a magical core, I hope you found this explanation um, of interest. And those of you with the necessary equipment can now make a wand, at least at this stage, yourselves. So, it only remains for me to thank Tom's employer for his advice and use of his equipment, uh, oh yes, and for arranging that these instructions be made generally available to the Muggle world. And, of course, to thank Tom for doing such an excellent job. His newt project should be worth a distinction, unless I'm much mistaken. In fact, I think Tom deserves to have the last word. So I shall say farewell to you now, and leave him to close in whatever way he chooses. Hi there, Muggles. I'm back home again now. They let me keep the wand. Well, it wasn't much use in school, was it? But I was thinking. You know how they said that any wand, even a wand made from one tree like this one, won't actually work without a real magical core in it? Well, I was able to get hold of some real interesting books from the library. I'd already had a good troll through the restricted section, of course, me being given full access to any equipment and stores the school might have. But then I came on the little door, right at the back of Restricted, with a notice on it which said, Prohibited. Well, I couldn't pass that up, could I? And I found some real interesting books on wand-making there. From what I've read, the old wizards used to use manticore skin a lot in their wands, with one or two other odds and ends. So I had a good rummage through the store cupboard at the back of potions and charms rooms, and guess what? I found everything I needed. Even an old wand rack and a goblin-made silver shaker, just like it said in the book. Hadn't been used for years, of course, but they soon cleaned up. Yeah, it was all there, quite tempting, really, with everything set up. And this wand from the wand-maker does more than just find wand trees. Hmm. The spells needed to bung it into the old wand aren't that difficult. Just needed the ingredients, ground to a powder and sprinkled onto the shaft. Then, with a bit of the old wand too, the powder sucked right in there. And all it needs is to clean up the leftovers. Don't want that stuff hanging around for too long. And we're ready for a trial run. And... Hey! Result! Yes! real handy. So, now that I've got an unregistered wand that actually works, 
I thought I might go out with a bit of underage disapparition. What do you think? So, good luck with your ones, muggles, and see you around. Bye. Oh dear, it looks as if Tom has discovered why Manticore came to be dropped in the manufacture of wands, and it is as well for Tom that we did not lift the disclosure charm as soon as the project was over. You see, uh, although Manticore possesses many valuable characteristics, the fact that only the skin of the creature was used probably accounts for its acting, in the case of self-administered charms or spells, only on the skin of the person holding the wand. Well, the skin and whatever's inside it, fortunately. So you see, wherever Tom has gone, he's gone without his clothes. And, what's more important, without a wand. This would be a serious problem indeed, but fortunately we should be able to find him uh, thanks to another peculiarity of the Manticore wand, and it is this. It was soon recognized uh, that in the case of a wand which has been made with Manticore skin, when used as a means of disapparition, well, it always returned its owner back to the one tree from which it was made. This inconvenient characteristic has never been satisfactorily explained, but it should save Tom from his present um, predicament. Now, although conditions at this time uh, late November and close to midnight uh, will have spared Tom a good deal of the embarrassment which he might otherwise have experienced. Uh, I'm sure that he must by now be rather cold and in need of his clothing. So I'm sure you'll understand if I go now uh, to reunite uh, the one with the other. So, Good luck, Muggles. Have fun with your wands. And for the present at least, goodbye.
Hello again, Muggles. There's a little treat for all of you who did watch through to the end. Here is some additional information. I'm sure some of you may be wondering what happened to the Manticore Wand and to Tom. Well, Professor Durkin argued that the wand should be destroyed, or at least rendered inert and sent out to a muggle, as some old ones have been, as part of the Concordance Initiative. But I was firmly against this, and fortunately, as Professor Durkin's senior colleague, my decision was the one which counted. You know, I think the Professor's judgment may have been coloured, by a rather unhappy experience he had with that wand. You see, he was explaining to a number of others in the staff room what had happened to Tom, and possibly he became too engrossed in the story. Well, at any rate, at the request of one of our younger members of staff, he unthinkingly, and it has to be said, unwisely demonstrated Tom's mistake in using the wand in this apparition. Oh, so this is the wand Tom made. Oh, indeed it is, and a very fair job he made of it. Not as good as one of Willoughby's wands, of course, but for an inexperienced youngster, under my guidance for some years, of course, so very creditable indeed, even though he did go a little too far in the end. He may have thought that he was safe to do so, because this apparition is not normally possible within the boundaries of the school. And again, he was wearing protective gloves. But a manticore wand is more than a match for such precautions. Yeah, but what exactly happened? Oh, that, uh, that all came about uh, due to his ill-advised attempt to insert a core at his age. Quite ridiculous. I understand they were all quite startled at what happened next. But you've still not shown us what happened. Oh, well, he held the wand in an unprotected hand, uh, rather like this, and attempted, of all things, a wand-induced disapparition. And this wand is so powerful, he only had to think of it. Oh, don't tell me Durkin's done it again. Oh, my God, that man is a complete fool. He always has been since he came to the school years ago. Well, I can remember some of the things. I'll tell you some of the things that will make it all one. I really well, we sent Tom back to the one tree with the professor's clothes and as soon as possible, of course. But this was in the middle of the day, and I understand that they had some difficulty in effecting and, well the escape uh, from a farmer and one of his men. Oh yes, uh, and a dog. At any rate, I believe the professor put his views on the incident rather forcefully to poor Tom, who has, I think, uh, more than seen the error of his ways by now. Uh, so what? We must Although Tom did not know it, uh, it was some of my old equipment uh, which he found at the back of the charms cupboard. I used to teach charms, you know, when I first came here. And the wand maker's wand, well, that's mine also. Another episode from my past which few remember now. I do not use it these days, of course. Not since I took a full-time position at the school. Still, it was good to see that it had lost none of its old powers. So, you see, it was no great problem for me to remove the manticore preparation which Tom had infused within it. Quite an achievement, I thought, for someone at his age. And I replaced it with something which would be much more useful to him. Based on Dragon's Claw, you know, I felt that would better suit Tom's character. Good for defence, and so on. In any case, it would have been a terrible mistake to separate that wand from its owner. Whilst we're all familiar with the phrase, the wand chooses the wizard, 
It is very few wizards indeed who have the privilege of being chosen by a wand tree, and that particular tree is known to be less than forgiving, which is why we suggested it. And then to have actually made the wand from the tree's timber, well, that will have forged a very special link indeed, the full strength of which will probably not be fully realized by Tom for some years to come. Professor Durkin finally accepted that his pupil did, after all, show commendable initiative in the full completion of his project, and uh, he agreed that the wand should be returned. And now, as the year is drawing to its close, and Tom has had ample time to become familiar with his new wand, I understand uh, that he has been getting some excellent results, and indeed has been surprised by its powers. You know, I feel sure that Tom will put that wand to excellent and um, hmm, sensible use. In the future. But do remember, Muggles, don't try disapparition, will you? Levitating a snowball may be harmless, but you never know. The wood you have chosen for your wands might just have come from a wand tree. Until the next time, then, good luck and goodbye.